are listening to From Sobriety to Recovery with Jesse Mogul. Let's get to the show. Welcome back to From Sobriety to Recovery. I am your host, Jesse Mogul. I am in addiction recovery, and I am once again thrilled to be here. And I say it every time because I mean it every time. And after last episode, I have been super pumped to bring you the very first real episode in the Breaking Through Gravity series. Now, whether that name changes and it just becomes Breaking Through, it becomes the Gravity series, I don't know. I don't know because I'm literally just creating this on the microphone with you. Although I did a tremendous amount of research for this one, and I am looking at multiple books in front of me and a pretty healthy Trello uh, established for this episode. So if you didn't listen to the Breaking Through Gravity episode, I believe it's 231, that you should go back and you should listen to that before you listen to this if you're new to the show. That will give you an idea of what we're talking about here. But I will, of course give a brief overview. So this idea of breaking through gravity started with me and Tom, who runs his way, discussing how we live in Huntsville, a city built upon this idea of breaking gravity, getting into outer space, being able to really take humankind where it had never been before. The rockets that were utilized in the Saturn and the Gemini and the Titan and obviously getting us to the moon, all first developed here by von Braun and the Nazi scientists that we got um, after World War II. Yes, we made it to the moon because of Nazis. Uh, If you didn't know that, sorry to break it to you, that's how it worked out. So here is Huntsville with all of these rockets known throughout the land as being the place that developed the engines and the rockets and the boosters and all that jazz that helped us break through gravity to get us to the moon via breaking the gravity and getting to outer space. So that's how this whole thing started by a quick two minute conversation uh, with Tom over at his way. And from there, of course, my brain just began to run. And really, I started taking notes during that conversation. I was like, oh my goodness, dude, this is the best podcast topic ever. And then it just began to grow into this whole idea of how could this become a series of episodes that strategically tie us to our goal of breaking through gravity. And the gravity can be our own self-image. It can be our own thoughts. It can be our own feelings. It can be our previous actions. It can be the way that society and family and social circles and friends uh, view us or talk about us or or talk about people similar to us as a whole, which we will get into very in depth shortly. It can be a way. Uh, it can be a way that organizations and governments and policies are written around uh, those of us going through addiction recovery or working our way through a mental. Um, health issue. And even the way that this stuff is talked about, and again, we're getting ready to get in on the deep end. So I'm trying not to hint around too much, but I just want to finish up with this brief overview that gravity is all encompassing. Just like it's everywhere on planet Earth, it is everywhere in your life. And when we're seeking to break through our gravity and become this better version of ourselves that we have been thinking about and dreaming about and then contemplating about and planning for and taking action toward, It is this gravity that is all a part of us breaking through to achieve our desires, to become the person that we have known has been locked inside all the time, to achieve that potential that even if no one else ever told us we had it, that we always knew there was something inside of us that could achieve it. And that's the key that I think I was blessed to have been raised by a mom who really told me I had a great potential. I had people around me who noticed things in me who said, you've got great potential. I was programmed to believe I had potential at a very young age, and I know not everybody is blessed with that historical benefit that I was. I very much feel strongly that knowing that people believed in me was one of the things that helped get me through some of the toughest times of my addiction. And I even remember, you know, first settling into being an alcoholic and a drug addict at Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana in the fall of 1994 and saying to myself, one day you're going to have to leave all of this behind if you're ever going to reach your truest potential. That day came on January 12th of 2017 many fucking years later. How many years later was that? Like 22, something like that. So 
22 years of swimming in the cesspool of my own filth before I finally realized that now was the time to break through. And there's been a lot. And I still have gravity around me. And that's something I've been talking to a lot of my clients with and people in the tribe recently is that you know, seven years doesn't make me better than anyone any more than I think somebody with 27 years is better than me. We have more experience under our belt, but we're still going through very, very, very similar things as somebody at hour seven or day 17 or day 117. We have more resources and more experience and perhaps more tools underneath our belt and maybe not. Maybe some people have managed to do it with very limited resources and without much growth. But however somebody achieves it, they still have achieved it. I know someone who's got over two years who hasn't attended meetings, who hasn't really delved in to the pain and the hurt of the suffering, but still has achieved two years. And that is laudable. That is fireworks go off celebratory because it's not easy to release the addiction to let go of our drug of choice and say, you know what, no matter what I have to feel, I'm going to figure out a way to feel it and work through it. Uh, Somebody else in the tribe recently said, you know, I can see why addiction recovery is so difficult to get into and to achieve long term because it takes time. It takes effort. And another one of my coaching friends I was talking to recently, she actually works with women who overeat and have eating issues. Um, eating, I don't, I won't, I don't want to call it a disorder anymore because that's stigmatizing, which we're going to get into. Um, but it's definitely, you know, the eating issues. Um, I haven't done enough research to know the proper way of calling it, but in the past it was called a, an eating disorder, and it was bulimia or anorexia. Now I believe that it's not. You, we don't utilize disorder anymore, but it's certainly a, an eating use issue. Um, anyways, moving through that, getting back to the conversation I was having with her, is that we had started to jostle around about what it is to be an overeater, an overdrinker, an overdrugger, you know, to have this addiction within us. And we both very much felt comfortable settling on this idea that it's not overeating or overdrinking or overdrugging, it's underfeeling. It's not feeling the emotions that we have. And so then we started getting to this idea, well, how are we breaking through these emotions? How are we achieving healing while at the same time feeling these emotions and realizing that even when we work through the emotion in the moment, it's not like the emotion never comes back. It's we've healed that one particular time when we felt it, but it's just as easily as going to come back at a different time. I can feel embarrassed uh, for one reason or another and be able to work through that emotion in the now. And then three days later, something else embarrassing happens. I don't get to just work through embarrassment and be like, cool, cool, done with embarrassment. Sweet, put that on the shelf. All good there. Uh, Let's get at fear. Fear, yep, took care of that yesterday. No more fear in my life. (laughs) I wish it worked that way, but it doesn't. And that is part of the beauty of the human experience is that there is this internal desire to work through the external challenges that present us with these emotions and that create these pictures in our minds that cause us to feel these emotions. So it's this amazing loop. And when you start to think about breaking through your gravity of your addiction, whatever that might be, whatever drug of choice you might have, and there are process addictions too, shopping and gambling and pornography and and social media apps, I mean, all of it. So there's substance use addictions, where you actually have to consume an external thing in order to achieve an internal desire, emotion, or a feeling, or a high, right? So you take something, smoke marijuana, and you feel whatever affects you desire from the marijuana. Take the LSD, and now you're tripping, and you get the the breathing and the visuals, and the wah, 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 wah. you get that stuff. Um, you know, do the cocaine, you get that buzz, you get that high. You have to take a substance use in order to achieve a desire. But there's process addictions where it's doing something in order to achieve the desired feeling. So if you want it, whatever you get from, you know, the eating or the drinking or the gambling or the sexting or the apps or the, you know, all of it, whatever a process addiction is, 
you know, I know a lot of people have shopping addictions and they'll spend three, four hours on Amazon just buying a tremendous amount of ridiculous shit and then finding themselves returning it later. But they were looking for some level of dopamine serotonin release and they achieved it in the moment and then they looked at their credit card statement, regretted it, and then had to take care of that. So there are the substance use addictions and there are process addictions and they're all part of the gravitational pull of just the human experience of us habituating ourselves towards things that are going to give us some kind of feeling that we desire. And that's that dopamine, you know, serotonin, that's the whole limbic system, that's the whole thing. It's the neurotransmitters, it's all involved in this. So now we are looking to work ourselves through that. Let's say that we've gotten through the pre-contemplative stage, which clearly I'd say you all are, or you wouldn't even be listening to a show like this. You'd be like, from sobriety to recovery, what the hell is that guy talking about? I'm talking about getting from drinking to drunken. You know, <laughs> you know, oh, let's, where's the podcast from drunk to blacked out? That's the show I want to listen to. That's what pre-contemplative people would be potentially saying in a jocular way. Uh, but generally, if you're listening to this, you're at least at the contemplative stage, which means you're contemplating a a way out of your addiction process or substance use. And uh, there's also a lot of planning out there, right? So contemplative starts to work in accordance with planning our way out of it. This is just the stages of change. And then once you've contemplated and planned, then you take action and then you're looking at either maintenance behaviors or lapse slash relapse behaviors. And so if you're listening to this show, clearly we're in contemplative and planning and action and maintenance or, or lapsing stages somewhere in between. So What does all this have to do with what the hell we're going to talk about today? So I have been doing a pretty darn good job of figuring out how to start to lay out episodes in hopefully an order that makes sense. So I'm not hopping around all over the place. And I still don't think I figured it out perfectly yet, but I definitely came down to what I want the first episode to be, which is what today's is. And it's on stigma. Now I've sort of hinted around to this talking about how we talk about things, how we label things, the names that people are using, the way institutions and society and social circles might talk about us. Why do I think stigma should be the first part of the Breakthrough Gravity series? Well, one, uh, I'm not so sure I do. I'm not so sure that seven episodes from now I might say something like, This should have been episode one. Also, I realize these don't have to be done linearly and that we can jump around and we can figure it out together. And then lastly, why I did settle on this out of the list I have in front of me of the episodes that I could be doing instead of this one is that I started to think the other day, and once I had settled on the Breakthrough Gravity series, I told my unconscious and conscious mind to figure out some episodes that would really launch this thing off strongly. And I'm going about my days, and it took about two, three days for everything to really start to solidify. And I started to reverse engineer what addiction recovery all the steps to it. And as I begin to reverse engineer, you know, from being in a long-term addiction recovery and being happy with life and achieving desires and dreams and goals and things of that nature, I started breaking down all of the things that you have to do in order to achieve those things. And then also barriers and hurdles that we have to overcome in order to be able to achieve these things. And as I begin to reverse it further and further and further or closer and closer and closer to day one, what started to circle back over and over and over again in my mind is that when we want to achieve breaking through the gravity of addiction, we have a lot of internal self-talk that is going to affect us, whether desirably or undesirably, positively or negatively, good or bad, right or wrong. Any of these could work and they could all not work. Either way, there are when we're going to do this, there's going to be internal self-talk, but there's also going to be external talk. And external talk is going to come from everybody else. And what filters might those people be using in the moment to talk to us, to describe us, to be able to picture our addiction in their heads if we have just met them? I meet a lot of people. I go to a lot of networking events. I am not shy about telling people that I'm in addiction recovery. I know what my internal picture of my addiction is like, right? We take, uh, we take our five senses, touch, taste, sight, sound, smell. It feeds us in information from the external world. It goes through a bunch of processes and filters, and it kicks in this thing we call an internal representation. 
It's just the way you represent internally the external world. These are the pictures in your mind. I've talked about this before. Picture a golden retriever. Picture a rocket. Picture gravity. You've got something that pops into your mind when I say picture a a red bicycle. Did you think about Pee Wee Herman's bicycle from the Pee Wee Herman Big Adventure movie from the 80s? No? Then you're wrong. (laughs) Because that's the only red bicycle that exists on the planet, yo. Anybody you ask to picture something is going to have a picture. And a red bicycle may not be Pee Wee Herman's. It could very well be that little red trike bike that you had whenever you were a kid. Whatever it is, you have internally represented an external thing. So when you say to somebody that you have an addiction, they are going to naturally have their own internal representation of what that means. Now, is that being stigmatized? Are they utilizing stigmatizing language patterns in their heads to think about us? Because it's going to change the way they interact with us. It's going to change the way they talk to us. And it's definitely going to change the way they talk to uh, talk about us when we're not around. And these things are going to affect our journey from sobriety to recovery. As much as we would love to block other people's words and behaviors and actions and side eyes and facial expressions, we are too attuned and too self-aware as human beings to just block out all the nuances and idiosyncrasies of people's physical body language around us that we might even interpret being toward us even if it's not. And it's integral that we begin to siphon out the reality of what's being presented to us versus the figment of our imaginations, the made up stories that we're telling ourselves in our heads. Because you can achieve long term addiction recovery, not because other people have. That itself is a stigmatizing statement. Well, I achieved addiction recovery, so you should be able to achieve addiction recovery. That's an actual pretty dickhead thing to say somebody. And let me explain to you why. And if you said it to people, I'm not calling you in this moment a dickhead. I'm just generally saying that I think it's a dickhead thing to say to somebody. And here's why. Because if I were to look at you, and I don't even know you, you were to see me on the street and be like, Jesse, hey, I'm, I'm an addict. Uh, you're sober. I'd love to be like you. And I say, hey, man, if I could do it, you can do it. What I'm basically saying in that moment is whatever shit I went through is way worse than the shit you went through. Like, I don't know what kind of things you're going with and you're dealing with over there, but mine was way worse. Let me tell you the 77 reasons why my life sucked way more than yours. Therefore, if I can do it, you can do it. If you hear it through that megaphone, like I just said it, it does sound pretty rude. And maybe I was stigmatizing by even calling it dickhead. A thing to say to somebody, but I, that's just my perspective. I will not say that to somebody because it does sound rude. It, to me, the way I picture it, that, sound, that seems rude to say, oh, if I can do it, you can do it. Now, we can do it, not just because other people have done it, but certainly that helps. Right? Going to the moon was tough enough because nobody had ever been there. Right, But we knew we could send something up into the atmosphere pretty high. I mean, we had airplanes flying by that point. So we knew we know how to break gravity to a certain extent. Now we just need to figure out how to break gravity, get up into outer space, also get an object to a particular point. Also, we needed to land that object, and we needed to figure out how to get people to walk around up there on said object and be able to get back in the object that they flew to get on top of the object and then get that object off of the object and then get it back to the planet Earth and be able to open up the door in our atmosphere and not be burned (laughs) like hot dogs left on a grill for 17 hours. Breathe, Jesse, breathe. So we know that addiction recovery is possible. Yes, because other people have done it, but not because they've done it, but just as an attribute of the human ingenuity, the human desire to achieve, the human ability to have a neuroplasticity brain that can shift and grow and evolve. Right? We don't want to lay down this idea that everybody is just going to easily achieve it because somebody else easily achieved it. We know it's achievable because people have been in addiction and then they have stopped drinking or stopped using or shop, stopped shopping for frivolous things at four in the morning. We know it's possible. Yes, because it's been done. But even if it had never been done, 
we still know it's possible. Because if humans have shown one thing, it's the ability to do things that nobody else has done before. Somebody always has to be first. You might be the first person in your family to break the cycle. You might be the first person in your apartment to break the cycle. You might just be the first, I don't know, six foot three T-swam from Oklahoma City who once lived in Singapore and blacked out in Cuba to do it. I don't know. But we all get to be our own first. And we're going to do that by understanding what's being said around us and how that those language patterns can be negatively affecting the reprogramming we're attempting to place upon ourselves from sobriety to recovery. And said easier is that words program us They program us the way that we think, the way that we feel, the way that we act, and all of those thoughts, feelings, and actions give us results. Everything about us is this little tiny program running inside of our minds. We are just a series of code. Did humans build computers in our image, or or are we all just simulations? That's for another episode. But for today, we're going to talk about stigma. And the first thing I want to talk, and I know that was, uh, was that a really long, drawn-out intro to finally get to stigma? In a way, I feel like I've been talking about it for the last 21 minutes already. And first things first is I want you to consider the reasons the the presuppositions, the things that people are presupposing, or the assumptions someone might make about another person, what reasons? What are the what is that person presupposing about the addict? What assumptions are they making about another person? Because everybody makes presuppositions and assumptions, and they make these reasons up in their head for why one person behaves a certain way based off of their own memories and experiences and things that they have to draw upon in their own brain where their own programming lies, right? Understanding or even just asking yourself, not even having to ask the other person, why did you just make that stigmatizing statement? Or why do you believe this one thing about this culture, race, gender, orientation, right? You don't even have to ask. You can just simply say, what might that person have gone through in order to be making these kinds of assumptions, these presuppositions, to be forming these reasons, to have these negative thoughts and feelings about this particular person or subculture of the people around them. This gives us insights into how to respond rather than to react to the other person's stigmatizing language or actions or behaviors. People don't inherently wake up looking to just set the world on fire. Things have happened in their lives that have led them to have these thoughts and these feelings. And as misguided as we might think they are, it's real to them. And we cannot tell somebody their reality isn't real. They're not going to listen to us. You see this happen in politics all the time. The left says this and they, oh, the right's full of shit. No, the left's full of shit. Everybody thinks their reality is real and that everybody else's reality is misguided. Because it's what we experienced. And we've spent years in our heads convincing ourselves that these biases and assumptions and presuppositions are real. Somebody is not just going to walk in and say five sentences and change somebody else's mind. It's going to take a lot more information and education and effort in order to break through these stigmas. But we can break through the stigmas. Again, because we have seen it done before. And even if we had never seen it done before, uh, we know we can do things for the first time. Michael Jordan, somebody once said, you cannot jump from the free throw line and slam dunk a ball, and then it was done. And then somebody, I'm sure, once said, you cannot light a dark room without uh, a candle. And then somebody figured out a way to light a dark room without a candle. And then somebody else said, "Um, we're always going to be riding around on horses. There's no way to ever come up with a mode of transportation that's more efficient than this four-legged awesome creature over here. And then somebody figured that out. We have invented and evolved our species through countless 
too many to even begin to try to think about counting situations where we needed to invent something in order to be able to break through our own gravity and move on to the next phase of humanity. Understanding that mental health and the importance of it in our society, that to me is one of the biggest things that we are now evolving through as we move forward in the 21st century. Because we have had a shit ton of emotionally unintelligent people raising emotionally un- un- uh, emotionally unintelligent people, and the cycle has been going on for tens of thousands of years. It is finally time that we can talk to one another with empathy and compassion and just a sense of connection. And so when we get into this idea of stigmatizing language, I really want us to just be monitoring not just the way other people are utilizing it, but how are we utilizing it? And I came up with a really, it was really a co-created metaphor tonight with one of my uh, clients. He calls me up out of the clear blue to check in, say what's up, have a really meaningful conversation. And we started talking about how when you first decide to step into sobriety and recovery, that oftentimes, not for everybody, but oftentimes for most of us, our life has really been shattered into a million little pieces and that we're sitting here trying to cobble back together a life with all these broken pieces. And it's just this fragile, broken glass that we're you know, on our hands and knees with a tube of glue, just trying to figure out how can I just possibly put together just a little fragment of my life? How can I take all of these broken pieces of glass and puzzle them back together? And as we begin to move from contemplation into planning, into action, into maintenance, we really start to put together this amazing house of ours. And I've talked about the house metaphor before. Our three spheres and our four pillars creating this amazing McMansion with these 12 rooms. And our house really is, a, it's, to me, it's a real thing. It's inside of our minds because that's where we live. In our minds, talking about ourselves and talking to ourselves and talking about other people and everything else. So we create this amazing house and it's made of glass. And, it, and we decided as, as my client and I were talking about this, I was like, you know, it's made of glass and I'm just not somebody who's willing to throw stones in my own glass house. And from there, he and I just co-created this beautiful metaphor of that our, our sobriety is like this glass house. And we have to be very mindful of throwing stones. And then we also have to be mindful that it's not always a big rock that can break our house, that it can just be a small pebble thrown at the same spot over and over and over and over again. And if we break our own glass house, if we lapse or if we relapse, it's not that we've gone back to base zero. We already have all of the resources that helped us get the glass house built up the first time. So now we're able to build it up a little bit faster, maybe a little bit stronger. Now we know where some of the weak points are. Now we know who some of the contractors are that we need to make sure we have on auto dial in case we need help. Contractors being a nice little way of metaphorically bringing in sponsors and mentors and recovery coaches and therapists, right? So even if you build up this amazing glass house and you relapse, or it doesn't even have to be going back to alcohol or drugs. It could be ending a relationship or getting into a huge argument or losing a bunch of money or getting fired from a job. Like parts of this house can, they can just shatter. And now we've got to rebuild them. And when we go to rebuild them, we want to be mindful of where the weak points are and building those back up. And how are we stigmatizing ourselves in our heads? What are the words we say to ourselves about ourselves when things go sideways? Because that will show you a very key reality, a realness to the way you believe in yourself in your head. If you're always saying things like, I'm stupid, or I'm a dumbass, or I'm an idiot, or I'm psychotic, or, you know, I'm just, oh, you know me, I'm just a little crazy, I'm just a dope, oh, I'm just a little goofy. I mean, yeah, I get some people want to, you know, this might be where some people want to jump in with this whole woke stuff and say, okay, we're now we're all a little bunch of powder puff cupcake butterflies, and we can't say anything mean to ourselves without, you know, getting our tookishes hurt. But the reality of it is, is that when we were little kids, and we used to say things like sticks and stones can break my bones, but names can never hurt me. That was bullshit. That was a lie. Because if you repeat something enough, it's like little drops of water on a stone that can just slowly, slowly, slowly erode it, 
We don't think water has that much power, but go look at the Grand Canyon and tell me what tens of thousands of years of a river flowing through the same area can do to very, very hard rocks and stones. Well, we are also very penetrable. And if we continue to say negative things about ourselves to ourselves over and over and over again, which we often have been since we were kids, that's stigmatizing language and that's harmful. And then you go to get sober. You make this decision to get sober. And now it's not just your drug of choice that you're trying to counteract, that you're trying to fight against. It's your own belief system about yourself that you're trying to fight against. Talk about some freaking gravity. So now we want to break through the gravity of our addiction. And then we, you know, we, we set that aside for a day, a week, a month, a year, however long. But that's not it. <laughs> now we actually have to feel. And like I, the conversation I brought up earlier that I was having with my life coaching friend is that you know we don't have an over-drinking, over-eating problem as much as we have an under-feeling problem. Not knowing how to deal with our emotions at some stage in our life is what left us susceptible to an addictive substance or an addictive behavior to begin with. We want to feel. And feeling cannot feel great all the time. But it is imperative that we understand that it's in the feeling. Each time we move through it, we start to puzzle piece back this glass house of ours, that we make it a little stronger, make it a little bit more durable. We make the, it not so susceptible to wind and tornadoes and hurricanes. All of a sudden, we're able to put a little bit stronger plexiglass up, or we're able to build it at just the right angle so some rocks can ricochet off of it. It's in the process of going through the challenges, of dealing with our emotions, of healing through them, of talking with them with other people, that we begin to actually heal. It's, to me, imperative. And it's not always easy, trust me, from somebody who is, you know, very much has the propensity for passive-aggressive, you know, kinds of communication strategies. I'm very disorganized in my attachment strategy. So I am not by any stretch of the imagination, it's cured. Because there is no cure for the human experience. So when we start thinking about stigmatizing language, understand that it reflects this discriminatory attitude, a disrespect or a shame, or even contempt towards ourselves and other people. Now, we get a lot of it from the news and media, because the news and media needs clickbaity things. You know, this started... A long time ago. This started with, I uh, believe if I know my history of journalism accurately, and this isn't a journalism episode, so don't hold me to what I'm getting ready to say, but I'm pretty sure it was Hearst and Pulitzer. Back in the early 1900s, they began to sensationalize their headlines uh, in New York City in order to sell more newspapers. And from there, they realized that sensational headlines sell. And they started figuring out ways to um, use sensationalizing language patterns in their headlines. And now, flash forward, you know, a hundred some years later, and that has absolutely been expertly, you know, navigated by our current news media, you know, uh, whether it be the Huffington Post or BuzzFeed. They're all, I mean, you know, those are just the two I remember being very good at having headlines that absolutely want to get you to click on that link. We are known for our sensationalizing headlines. And what better way to get somebody to click on something but than to throw stigmatizing language patterns into the headlines that label a particular person as being this particular thing, right? Somebody robs a bank, and you're like, yeah, somebody robs a bank. Crazy schizophrenic, high on, high on meth, uh, screaming profanities at the sun, claiming they were Jesus, robs a bank. Which one of those are you clicking on? Person robs bank or all that other stuff I said right before person robs bank? I'm definitely, I'll be pretty damn tempted to click on the second one, especially if there's a video clip. So news and the media love using stigmatizing language because it feeds off of our desire to see other people suffering because our suffering can be so much sometimes that the only way to be able to you know navigate it is to see that other people have it worse than us i know it's very odd psychological trick we play on ourselves but it's also very real 
So individuals can also influence stigmatizing language patterns by talking about mental illness in a certain way, by talking about people with a mental illness in a certain way. And whether it's, you know, addiction to alcohol or meth or kratom or marijuana or Percocets or, you know, Oxycontin or it's gambling and sex and porn and sexting and apps, like it's all part of the mental illness family. I've got this whole book in there about mental health disorders um, that is just, (laughs) if I were to hit you upside the face with it, it might knock you out. It's that freaking thick. So there's a ton of these and they're all under this mental illness category. So how are people talking about others? Because if we come to believe what people say about us, then it's very real that it will limit what we believe we can achieve. So when we go and decide that we're going to become sober and we start talking about this with other people, their stigmatizing beliefs around addicts could very much cause them to say something that's very hurtful to us, that leads us to believe we can't achieve that. And if we already are coming in to the very beginning stages of action into the sobriety world with low self-esteem and low self-confidence, at that moment, there's a high level of susceptibility to these negative language patterns somebody might accidentally inflict upon you without even necessarily meaning to say anything that might you know, squash your thunder. Again, I don't think people wake up looking to be hurtful, but they can just say hurtful things. And it's just the way that it is. And if we're not prepared for the fact that not everybody is going to see what we're doing through the same lens that we're seeing it from, that we're experiencing it from, there's a very good chance that we might start to absorb the stigmatizing language that they're saying to us or around us, or even just about other people. I have been told, on more than one occasion by somebody going off on their own little rant about those who suffer from addiction, uh, you know, disorders and substance use, they'll, they'll just say some of the most wackadaisical things. I'm just sitting listening like, what the hell is this person saying right now? And then they'll look me dead in the eyes and say, but not you, you're different. You're better than them. And I'm telling you, man, it's like being kicked in the crotch. I'm just like, no, uh, uh, nope, nope. I, I won't accept that. I have stopped people in their tracks and been like, nope, that's not me. That's not me. I I won't accept that. I was like, I know you think that that was a compliment. I was like, but that's not a compliment. I was like, that's not how I see the people in my world that, no, I can't. Sorry. That's not a conversation I can be a part of. It's like, we can begin to discuss some of the things that you just said and how it's not helping the situation, but please do not try to label me as being better than somebody else because that's just not the way that it is. I can get a little emotional talking about this because it's been some pretty important people in my life who've said that. And I'm just like, no, mm-mm, no, no, that's stigmatizing because you know me or, or you're just placating me. Or you're really what you're saying is that yeah you're still the same piece of shit all these other people who I just talk shit about are they're all you're all part of the same pieces of shit but you're standing in front of me so I feel the need to say something polite <laughs> either way <laughs> and I do strive to help people break the stigmatizing language patterns but also realizing that I can't make people change you know and sometimes is it, you know is this a hill that I'm ready to climb up and die on right now in this moment to me there are some times where I'm just better off saying you know what that that's good I think it's time you know what I I just realized I have some grass I need to go watch grow yeah, there's this really adorable spider that's been growing on bush number three outside my garage. Oh my goodness, I gotta go home and see if it's twinkling in the sunshine. So we want to be mindful of how people try to label us, what they try to say, because it can destroy our self-esteem and it can shatter our confidence. Because these labels are merely, it's, here's the thing about labels. It's often a projection. And a projection is what somebody does when they will take some issue that they have, that their unconscious mind wants them to notice in themselves, and they will project it, literally like word vomit it across the room over onto somebody else and say, well, look at that person. Look what's wrong with them. So people will take these labels and they will project them onto somebody else. To ref- and all this is is a reflection of their own beliefs of the people that right that's I have this belief about this person, so I'm going to say that they're all scumbags. All addicts are scumbags. That's my belief system, so I'm going to say that about them. But it can often really be some tremendous insight about the belief system they have about themselves. 
This is where we have seen people, uh, especially politicians. Politicians seem to be really good at this because they'll they'll say a bunch of stuff, and then later on we, we have it on tape what they said, and then they go off and they do something different when the circumstances around them change. We've seen uh, politicians come out strongly against homosexuality and then get caught in um, airport bathrooms in Minnesota um, trying to have homosexual activity with them, you know, with other people. With, there was some politician who was trying to do homosexual things in a male bathroom one time, and this dude was staunchly against homosexuality. We once saw John McCain many times over um, talk negatively about homosexuality until his daughter came out as a lesbian. And then all of a sudden it was like, well, um, okay. I mean, it's not that bad because I mean, I like her. So, all right, I guess I'll acquiesce on this one. We've seen politicians come out very strongly against marijuana being legalized and for very strict penalties for anyone caught using, distributing, or holding onto substances um, on their person when arrested. We've the three strike you're out. Our prisons are full of people in jail for what should amount to misdemeanors, but have, you know, three, you know, small misdemeanors. Next thing you know, you're in jail for 10 years over marijuana. And then as soon as marijuana is legalized, these are the same a-holes going out there and funding, um, you know, massive statewide marijuana growth plantations in order to maximize their profit off of something that they once demonized. So we see politicians literally project this stuff off. And then as soon as it bounces back and something in their life puts them in a position where they now need to change their belief system around it, they're more than happy to if it directly affects somebody that they love or can affect their bank account in a positive way. Those are just the public figures let alone what's happening you know, with the people who don't have cameras on them at all times. So we want to be mindful of these labels that we're throwing out, this name-calling, the gossip, the stereotypes. I literally have a whole list of stigmatizing words here, and I'm not going to read them all because we'd be here for another three days. But here's, I mean, there's some that, there's some that are just normal that we've, we've heard. Uh, they're a boozer. They're bonkers. God, they're so dopey. They're eccentric. What a druggy. Um, it just goofy as all hell. Um, some of these, I mean, they're, don't, goofy as all hell does not sound like a very hurtful thing to say, but I mean, you know, I, I think I'm a bit goofy, so of course I wouldn't think that. Uh, junky, kook, loony, madness, uh, nutter butter. Nutter butter's on this list. That's pretty awesome. Then there's a, some that are just straight, straight hilarious. The gates are down, the lights are flashing, but the train just ain't coming. <laughs> That is a whole lot of words to say to try to say that, you know, the lights are on, but nobody's home. Uh, one can short of a six pack. Yep. That's definitely something to say. Um, boy, that's out. You know, boy, that statement was out of left field. Um, and, you know, but there's paranoid on here. Retarded is definitely on here. Um, psychotic, psycho, postal, postal shows up on this list. Uh, patient shows up on this list. I'm um, not really sure how patient, I mean, if I say that somebody's patient, that doesn't seem stigmatizing. Or if they're a patient, that just simply tells me that they are currently at a facility. Um, there's Cuckoo, gone nuts. Yeah, gone round the bend. His antenna doesn't pick up all the channels. <laughs> um, his cheese has slid off the cracker. His elevator doesn't go to the top. His head needs to be shrunk. I don't think his URL allows outside access. <laughs> so I know some of these are a little comical, but I wanted to bring a little bit of levity into something that can often be experienced as a very uh, touch point subject. But when we think about stigmatizing language, it's discriminatory attitudes, disrespect, shame, and contempt. When we think about labels, it's, uh, you know, it is just us labeling somebody else, which is often a reflection of our own beliefs about ourselves, right? Or about people in our family. And it's literally just coming from from our memories and things of that nature. So we want to be mindful of how we're labeling other people. And again, I get, I'm not trying to be the woke police, right? I'm not into all that jazz. It's certainly not bringing it into this episode. You know, people are going to say things. And one of the things I remember, I remember saying this to some people in Los Angeles, because I had a very diverse group of friends there. And it was that, you know, I remember saying something sometime and like one of my friends just jumped down my throat and I'm not really sure uh, if I remember what was said. I don't, and I'm not even going to attempt to, cause I'll just bastardize whatever the topic was. And I'll, then I'll just muddle up the point I'm getting ready to make is that I remember saying to them like, look, I was like, I may not always know the right word to say in order not to offend you, but please don't respond back 
with an offensive statement. Just simply let me know what you would have preferred me to have said instead. And it's and it can literally be that simple. Like, I get it. A lot of words that were socially acceptable 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago are no longer. Hell, it feels like some things change on the month. Like one of my coaching friends works with autistic children. And so for the longest time, I thought it was socially acceptable to say, that, you know, oh, a child on the spectrum, right? Because when we, okay, here's the thing about stigma. We used to say they're a, um, a disabled person, but then it became a thing where we're putting the person behind the disability. So we're, they're, they are a disabled person. So the primary thing you should know about them is that they're disabled, not a person. That was the logic. That was the thinking there. So then it became a person with disabilities. We started putting the person before the label. There they are a person with a disability, right? Well, so with autistic children, I thought that it was a child on the spectrum. Right, and but apparently that changed, and I don't remember what it changed to, but I remember her correcting me in a very polite way. And so I was like, okay, cool. So in that conversation, I w- utilized the language patterns that she told me were socially acceptable and would not offend people, and I was more than on board with doing that because I have no desire to offend autistic children, let alone their caregivers. And then I remember about a month or two later, I saw her again, and we started getting into a conversation, and I started to use the words she had taught me in our previous conversation. And she corrected me and said, no, we no longer say it that way. Now we say it this way. And I remember were saying to her, I was like, I was like, and I said it with a smile and some in some jocular tonalities, but certainly said, is there a memo or an email list I can get on? Because it's it's a little off putting that every time we talk about autistic children, it seems like there's another five different ways I'm supposed to reference them. And that when I don't, I get side eye. I was like, you change in the vernacular so frequently, I can't keep up. And it's not like this shows up at the top of my news feed every day. My algorithm doesn't have any of those things programmed into it. And I told that long-winded story to let you just realize that things are shifting. And what was not even cool five months ago, or what was cool five months ago, isn't cool now or is cool now. It's a constant back and forth. It's a wave. There's an ebb and flow to this. So getting it always right, to me, isn't necessarily possible. I'm not going to say it's impossible, but you know how I feel about possible and impossible. Like, is anything always and never? No. So are we going to be able to generally get our language patterns down in a way that we will not you know, negatively affect somebody? Potentially. But it's also going to happen from time to time. And if you're the person who feels offended or hurt by something, then simply in a calm and in a nice way, bring it up that you would prefer if it was discussed in this way. Because changing labels can be extremely difficult just because people build language pattern habits and they're formed over time. So while we know that labels harm because they can block us from seeing the person behind the label, or we know that labels can also be helpful because they help identify people who do need special assistance in our society, it's the tonality and it's the timing and it's, and it's the meaning behind it. Are we trying to be nefarious and hurtful? Or are we seeking to build a bridge and connect with other people? It's going to be pretty obvious in the conversation being had which one of those intentions you're seeking to achieve in that moment. So self-stigma is humongous. It's internalizing the stigmatizing language and then believing that is who we are. And that is not who you are. You are not who you were yesterday. You're who you choose to be today. And I use the word choose very strategically because you are choosing to be that person. You're making that choice. Even if it's programmed in and it's habituated and it's an unconscious choice, at one point it was a conscious choice. And you chose to make that choice over and over and over and over again until it became habituated and unconscious. It's always a choice. So you get to choose to be who you are today, which could be fresh. It could still be very conscious. You could still be very much paying attention, having your self-awareness attuned to that. But the more you do it, the more you become the person you desire to become tomorrow. Yes, we all have a freaking boneyard of skeletons. A closet cuppeth runneth over. I'm talking Monica, you know, 
Monica from Friends, that little hidden closet where they never they never showed that closet before and never showed it after that one episode. Didn't even know there was a door there. I'd be willing if we went back and watched them crawl out the window onto the balcony time and time again, there wouldn't even have been a damn door there. But one episode, they decided to have a, a, a Monica Geller cluttered closet. And sure enough, there was a door over there all of a sudden. And there's all the skeletons in her closet because she wasn't as organized as everybody thought she was. We have that boneyard, but we are not just yesterday. In fact, that, it, that makes up so little of us. It created the foundation for us, but it, it makes up so little of us right now because now we're aware. Now we get to make new choices. Oh, well, this is how I've always done it is no longer a, an acceptable answer. Society, individuals, institution, peer groups, communities, all of these people can begin to use stigmatizing language. Right? There's that there, so there so just to be clear, there is the personal self stigma when we internalize the stigmatizing language and believe that it's who we are, right? And this can be placed upon us. We can come up with these ideas of who we are based off society and individuals, institutions, peer groups, communities. There's also the public stigma. This is the second of the three stigmas. It's the overall general public and subgroups of the general publics therein, how they use utilize language to stigmatize others. And that can come from family members, social groups, schools, workplaces, um, basically anywhere you frequent, like just public. It is just the general publics. And then there is the institutional. The institutional one is, is I would think, if I'm going to label any of these as the worst, it's the institutional stigmat- stigmatizations, stigma, that can be the most damaging. Because this is when laws and policies and passes and Laws, policies, practices, and directives. Laws, policies, practices, and directives. I have all these notes, and I've looked at them for like five minutes of this whole show. <laughs> so now I'm trying to go back through. I'm rather impressed how much of it I've actually clicked off. Um, laws, policies, practices, directives are paths that can harm or inflict negative attitudes, behaviors, or consequences upon a particular cultural population that you can really see where this was evident in the 80s when laws were passed that had strict enforcement on crack cocaine, but less strict enforcement on cocaine. And it's because crack cocaine was favored by the African-American population and cocaine was favored by the Caucasian population. So the laws were very much leaned to punish African-Americans way more severely than it was Caucasians. And this is the stigmatizing stigmatization that we talk about, right? This, a lot of this started back in the Nixon era, Nixon era. It's almost midnight and I'm talking super fast. I should slow the hell down. It is 1155. Um, (laughs) Nixon had this whole thing where he was going to start to really label hippies and black people as um, potheads and druggies in order to incarcerate them at a higher rate and frequency than the general population. And this war on drugs was started with him. Uh, It was transferred over to Ford when Nixon was um, impeached out of office. And then you look, you know, you can slide right into Jimmy Carter, who was a little bit more lackadaisical about it. But certainly when Reagan came into office, that's when you see the crack and the cocaine epidemic really sweep right about the same time the AIDS epidemic also hit. And it was just this entire passing of laws that were very much geared towards um, stigmatizing um, African Americans, the Hispanic population, and homosexuals as being the degradation of society. And we must lock them all away and we must strip away their rights. And yes, it is another dark chapter in the American history of governmental policies. Um, Unfortunately, we are still working our way through a lot of those today, but you can see how institutional stigma can really begin to have long-term consequences and effects on the population as a whole. And the beautiful thing that we've begun to get into since really 9-11, but a lot of this sharp uh, shifting from previous attitudes and behaviors came after the financial crisis in 08, 09, when mental health really began to finally get its just deserved in the spotlight. Then you see Olympians like Michael Phelps and Simone Biles and some really famous athletes come out and talk about their mental health issues. Same with um, actors and musicians who've come out with their own alcoholism and drug addictions and been able to heal. The more of them for some, you know, we tend to idolize 
idolize people in our society. In a way, all societies and cultures do this, but certainly for us, we have race people up onto a pedestal because they're good at sports or they're good at singing or they're good at acting. And because of our influence on the entire planet, we tend to create worldwide idols. And because of this, they have a abnormal influence on the population of the country they're in or just wherever they're popular. I mean, it's like Taylor Swift has turned the NFL into must-see TV for, for teenage girls. And she's not the first pop star to have dated a football player. I remember Jessica Simpson going to football games and she was dating uh, Tony Romo. And I don't remember there being nearly the fanfare. Now, mind you, Taylor Swift is on a whole nother level. I mean, she's up there Beyonce, right? So certainly I get why the the fervor around her attending these games and dating somebody who completely breaks the traditional uh, Taylor Swift uh, picture of a boyfriend that she would have, you know, being models or being uh, musicians. Now all of a sudden it's this, you know, unshaven beard, you know, gladiator slamming on other people. Anyways, the point being is that Taylor Swift is such an idol that she has literally turned the NFL into something that teenage girls care about. Previously, no one else was able to accomplish that. And so you have these idols that when they do things, they have a abnormal influence on society. So when they come out and they speak out against stigmatizing language, when they come out and they speak for mental health advocacy, when they come out and speak for physical, um, you know, abilities that others don't have. I don't even know the right word. I almost said physical disability. I don't even know if that's the correct way. But when they come out and they they speak out and advocate for people who are treated fairly, society tends to listen. It can have backlashes too. Ask the Dixie Chicks. But it, it certainly can have those moments where people can speak out and other people pay attention. It could still ostracize some of their fan base who don't feel that way. And then they get to make the decision on whether they still want to be a fan of this particular person because of what they've said about this particular thing. But either way, they have a, an amazing effect on how we tend to experience these issues in our society. And it's hard-pressed for anybody to talk too much shit about Michael Phelps or, Phelps or Simone Biles. So when they come out and talk about mental health, all of a sudden people start to listen. And so now we're in a society where we're transitioning from being a society that would have once shamed and stigmatized mental health issues. And now it's we're very much living in a world where you could tell somebody that you're bipolar, or you could s- tell somebody that you uh, have depression, or you could tell somebody you're in addiction recovery, and they're going to congratulate you and say nice things to you, and they're going to they're going to want to support that. Whereas, you know, just 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago, uh, ostrac- being ostracized from the tribe was more than likely going to be your, you know, condemnment in that moment rather than acceptance. So it is rather beautiful and harmonious in so many ways that people have begun to embrace and accept the infinite beauty of the human experience, but yet we still have so much further to go. So when we start to talk about institutional stigmas, we want to be mindful of the politicians we put into office and the laws and the policies and the practices and directives that they pass that single out one particular subset of our culture, of our society, of our of people who are on our planet and then put them into a negative light or cause those laws to to affect them negatively because statistics and studies show that if, if people are offered intervention and prevention treatment levels at just the right phase in their, in their life, whether that's adolescence all the way up to, you know, 80 years old, if they're offered these things, that a majority of them will seek treatment at some point and will and have like a 60% higher chance of actually attaining long-term recovery versus those who were never offered the prevention or the treatment at all, or when they were offered it, there was a ton of barriers between them and accessing it. And stigma is a huge role in all of what I just said. Because we might see black people or brown people or white people as this, that, or the other, and then we're going to start to stigmatize them. And we're basically saying that all of them are like this one experience I had. And that's a, it, it's, it's actually, there's actually a whole, um, what did I, let me, do, 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 where did I put it? Um, here it is. It is. Let me go to this. I think it's called the generalization fallacy. Hasty generalization. 
Uh, there's a whole direct converse inverse contrapositive thing I'm not going to get into because I'm not going to try to get you lost. And I've, this fucking episode's already way too long. Um, so there's this thing. It's called the hasty generalization where if this one person behaved this way, that means they're all that way. If one addict broke into my house and stole, that means all addicts are thieves. And that's just preposterous. That, 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 that is a hasty generalization any more than it would be that, you know, anybody who's been to jail is obvious, you know, murderers go to jail. Therefore, everybody in jail is a murderer. That's not the way that it works. You know, in, in neuro linguistic programming, when we treat, teach this, it's very much a chunking up, in, you know, versus chunking down. It's like if I can drive this car, I can drive all cars. Well, that may or may not be true depending on the intricacies of that car. But if I can drive this lawnmower, that means I can drive a car. Well, that definitely is not necessarily true because driving a lawnmower in grass is not the same as driving a car on a street. But if I can drive a car, then I can drive a lawnmower. There's a higher propensity that, yes, that is true, that the probability that because you can drive a car, you can drive a, a riding lawnmower. So again, it's just this idea of chunking up versus chunking down and finding the the hasty generalization in some of the things that we say. Right. Um, I knew this druggie who had a ton of tattoos. Therefore, everybody with a tattoo is a druggie. Definitely not true. Any more than I knew somebody with a ton of tattoos who did drugs. So anybody with tattoos is also a druggie. Right. It's, it doesn't work that way. Making these generalizations is part of the processing that our brain wants to do to make things easier to figure out. We, that's what stigmas are. It's stigmatizing language patterns are just these generalizations that are, that are, it's just lazy. It's just a lazy brain activity. And we don't want to have the lazy brain activity. So I'm going to get you guys out of here on this. Um, I have talked way too long on this. I swear, I, this is the problem with me getting on the microphone at like 11 o'clock at night. My brain starts firing like a thousand miles a second and I have all these notes and <laughs> I read the notes a couple times before I get on the microphone so I don't have to rely on them and I can just let my brain, you know, freestyle. And that definitely does. And that's how we find ourselves at a uh, hour and one minute and 11 seconds just now. So anyways, uh, I'm going to give you a five-step process to help you uh, break free of stigmatizing um, language patterns that you might be placing upon yourself or you might be placing upon others or others might be placing upon you. And this is uh, going back to the glass house metaphor. This is why it's important. Has somebody actively seeking sobriety and recovery? Do not throw rocks when you live in a glass house. We have been side-eyed. We have been side at. We have had our eyes rolled at us. We have had people uh, kick us out of our lives justly sometimes. We, we have people talk shit about us behind our backs, make fun of us, spread rumors about us. Again, potentially justly, but we have done some things. We know what it's like to feel an inch tall. We know what it's like to be at the bottom and somehow somebody figure out a way to kick us just a little further down. I know what it's like to wake up in the bathtub of death. Some of you out there know what it's like to hold a weapon in your hand and think that the only way out is the final way out. We know what it's like to scrape ourselves at the, at the barnacles at the bottom of the ocean. Do we really want to be the person who does that to somebody else? It's, it blows my mind when I hear people in sobriety and recovery at, at meetings that I've attended or events that I go to using stigmatizing language about other people, also in addiction recovery, also in our community, basically talking shit about somebody else in addiction recovery as if their shit don't stink. As if they live in like some amazing stone house that the third pig built because we know the first two built crappy homes and the wolf blew both those down. Well, you know what? The, the wolf has a backpack full of rocks. And what's worse is when we actually break our own house from the inside. So it's extremely important that we are not the ones spreading the stigma that we are the ones breaking the stigma, that we are standing up for those. And you can use this five-step system to help you with that. So if you're taking notes, hopefully you've got a couple full pages by now, but definitely write this down. I'm also going to put this into the show notes so that you'll be able to easily access it. So here it is. It's called React. I know I'm not a big fan of the word React, but this is the way I was taught it. 
um, in one of my CRSS classes, you know, I'm more about the respond, but you know, we can also utilize acronyms in a different way and not have a stigma around the word react. Certainly. Uh, you know, uh, I remember one time at a bar by a pool table, hanging out with a bunch of people. And I heard the pool ball behind me make a noise that didn't sound familiar. And I was sitting right there. And for some reason, I just put my hand in front of this girl's face and the cue ball ended up in my hand. That was me reacting. And I kept this cue ball from smashing this girl in the face because this person behind us had hit the ball wrong. I'll never forget that. Uh, It was the wildest thing. People around me freaked out. They were like, your back was to the table and you just put your hand out and you caught a ball. I'm like, I was like, it was, I was like, I just put my hand in front of her face. My hand is rather large and her face was not that big. So I just put my hand in front of her face and there was a cue ball in my hand. Uh, Anyways, so reaction, react, it can actually play out good. See how the brain works? Where the hell was that story? I hadn't thought of that story in 20 some years. And here I think about react and now I'm all of a sudden thinking about a cue ball at Dill Street. Dill Street down the house from the Sigma Phi Epsilon, down the street from the Sigma Phi Epsilon house uh, off of Riverside. Riverside. Yep. Riverside and Dill Street. Pretty sure that was the address. Anyways, react. Recognize the stigmatizing behavior. First, you have to recognize it. Recognizing the stigmatizing behavior allows us to do something about it. Don't just let stigmatizing language patterns wash off your back. Again, you don't always have to die on the hill every single time you hear something that's stigmatizing, but I want you at least to be aware that it's happening. It gives you an awareness of it, and then you can pick and choose your battles. Right Then there's E for explain. You can explain why this is hurtful to others, why it's not helping the situation. You can explain to them different uh, ways that stigmatizing language can adversely affect the people they're talking about. And then they also have an opportunity to explain to you what has happened in their life that would lead them to utilizing stigmatizing language patterns about this particular person or set of people. Because right? everybody has a life that they've lived. There's reasons or there, there's reasons. I almost said excuses, but um, excuses are, are what reasons are excuses that could have been avoided or excuses are reasons that could have been avoided. That's right. Um, one of my favorite sayings is excuses are reasons that could have been avoided. All right. Sometimes I'm, um, Hey, I'm three hours late or I'm 10 minutes late, but I left three hours before the meeting, but then aliens took over the highway. That's a pretty damn good reason. Hey, I'm 10 minutes late um, because I was messing around on my computer. Well, that's actually an excuse. It sounds like a reason, but it's, it could have been avoided. Therefore it's actually an excuse. So excuses are reasons that could have been avoided, but people have a reason for why they are saying something to you about this in the particular manner in which they are saying it to you. A really good opportunity is for you to explain why that's hurtful and then also ask some really amazing questions toward them to figure out why they've had that experience, what happened in their life. And then you can act. Act to support those being stigmatized. Be a part of the solution. And the first things first, it comes from being mindful of what you're saying, how you're saying this stuff. Then care. Care for those being stigmatized and care about the stigmatizer, right? Both people are in a place of hurt. Both people are in a place of shame in that moment, right? I know it may be hard to realize that the perpetrator is actually also, um, you know how I feel about the word victim, but in, in this situation, let's just say it. The perpetrator is also a victim here. Something has happened in their life where they have seen themselves as a victim. They've internalized it as these people have done bad things to me. Therefore, all these people deserve this label because they're all like this one experience I've had. There's hurt. There's pain. Right? They don't want to necessarily say these things. Right? If you say something shitty about somebody, you sort of know you sort of know you've done the wrong thing, right? Like I remember as being a kid in the 80s, for some reason, Pollock jokes were really popular. And back in like 1984, when I'm like eight or nine years old, I barely knew where Poland was on a map. I was a bit of a World War One and Two buff back when I was a kid. Dad would always have us watching like John Wayne movies and he was 
he's either a cowboy or in war. The guy didn't do many other things in his movies, but damn, he played a really damn good cowboy and a really good <laughs> military dude. So I was really into World War II. So I knew where Poland was because of what the Nazis did to Poland. And, and unbeknownst to me, making these Polak jokes whenever I was in the, in the 80s was actually quite hurtful. And had I realized the root cause for why... So a lot of these jokes were about Polak's intelligence... And it turns out later on in life, I, I learned that when the Nazis invaded Poland, they literally genocided anybody with a mediocre to a higher IQ. Like if you had a modicum of intelligence in Poland, you were genocide. You were gone. And they was, went through and they just genocided the whole damn near the whole country and who they didn't genocide right out the gate. Then they put in concentration camps and just let time do its own deed on them. So ultimately Poland just it got obliterated. And so whenever the World War II ended, um, the Polish who remained um, potentially did not have the highest of IQs. They were the ones who survived war camps, for goodness sakes. Like, things did not go well for them. And for some reason, a bunch of people decided to turn that into jokes about the country's intelligence. And then in the 1980s, you know, a bunch of you know eight-year-olds in Indianapolis are using Polak jokes to make each other laugh. I didn't realize that that was stigmatizing behavior, but now I do. And I, I've learned that in my teenage years and I care. I care about that. I care about stopping those kind of jokes. And I also want to know why the stigmatizer, why the joke teller says it in such a way. And this is different than comedians on a stage. Comedians on a stage are meant to entertain. They're, they, they bring stigmatizing language patterns to the stage to shine a light on them so that we can hear them from a different perspective and potentially begin to start shifting our opinions. I'm very much in favor of comedians, not just because I was one, for a couple years, but I understand the power in their storytelling. So there is a difference uh, in the environment, which is done. People staying around a water cooler, saying shitty things about the secretary who comes in smelling of vodka every once in a while. That's just a dick move. Somebody on a stage telling jokes in order to, you know, get people to laugh and sort of take some levity in the world that we live in. Uh, there's a difference. There's, there's definitely a difference. So anyways, that's enough of that. And then turn. Turn to your friends, turn to your coaches, turn to your mentors, your sponsors for support and for additional insights into these behaviors of others or yourself so that you can begin to propagate, you can begin to build up and destigmatize others um, and destigmatize yourself. Turn to others, find out what is it they've done. That whenever they've heard stigmatizing language, what is it that they are seeking to do on their end to help break through these barriers and allow people to be seen as the uh, infinitely beautiful human beings that we are? We all have this in us, this ability to recognize, to explain, to act, to care, and to turn. And I want us to begin to react towards this stigmatizing language in a powerfully grounded way. There's a difference between asserting yourself, being grounded, responding, and releasing the desire to be aggressive, and being straight up just confrontational. Understand that not everybody's going to know what you know. So whether they're making a false assumption about a wide group of people and utilizing language that isn't benefiting anybody but their own internal self-interests, okay, understand that. But you don't got to jump into their face about it. Approach them, discuss it with them, see if slowly but surely you can help them see and experience the world in a completely different way. We don't put words like end racism and stop the hate on the end zone of a football field and then just snap our fingers and everybody's not racist and nobody hates. That's not the way that it works. It works through kindness and connectedness and understanding and empathy and education. And then it works through experiences. Because if somebody has had a plethora of bad experiences with people who are addicts, you're not just going to be the first addict that they've ever seen be nice and be forthright and have integrity. And all of a sudden, they're just going to wipe away all their negative connotations they have of addicts because of all of those negative behaviors that have happened in front of them. That's not how it works. The human brain has a, it has a strategy for believing in something. It, it, what is it? Acceptance strategy, perception strategy, um, 
anyways, my brain's not going to get there and it's past midnight, but we have a strategy for when we'll believe in something. And once in a, you know, sometimes it gets, oh, I saw it once or therefore it's true. Other times we need to see it two, three, four, five, so many times. And you might think, but I've already done it four or five times, but that person just has a strategy in their head and you can't force them to accept anything. But you can continue to be the person you wish the world was made up of. You exude that first and foremost. Stigma starts at home. It starts in your head. Don't throw rocks in your own glass house. Stop saying mean shit about yourself. Stop saying that you're crazy or that you're nuts or that you're worthless or that you're a piece of crap or that you're, you know, uh, you're... Decompassionate. How was that? A few. Don't be saying you're a few bricks shy of a full load. Um, don't be saying that you're a fifty-one fifty. Uh, let me see. Don't. Oh, don't be saying you're in another world. I don't know. I really like that one. Um, oh, in La La Land. I say I'm in La La Land. Um, you know, sometimes I just rolling of the eyes is on here. Calling somebody a Fruit Loop or a Fruit Cake. Um, Jimmy Buffett has a really awesome song about fruitcakes. So um, that's the one exception to that, I suppose. Not the sharpest knife in the drawer. Um, sometimes you don't want the sharpest knife in the drawer for something. Sometimes you want a dollar knife so that you don't cut your thumb because you're not good at using cutlery, right? Um, pure bre- bedlam. There's a football game between Oklahoma and OSU called the Bedlam Game. Um, so I guess stigmatizing language has permeated so deeply into our society that some of these things, even by my own brain, during my own episode about not utilizing stigmatizing language, even I'm at them being like, well, I say that, I say that's wacko. I think I've said wacko in this conversation. Hell, I call people dickheads who say, <laughs> who say things like, well, if I can get sober, you can get sober. So even I mess up. Even I'm using stigmatizing language patterns, even in an episode about not utilizing stigmatizing language patterns. Unmotivated's on here. I would not have thought unmotivated. I mean, because unmotivated, I mean, that's a thing. People are unmotivated, right? So I don't know. You have to note it for yourself. You have to be able to monitor the words you're using, and you have to hear it for yourself, and you have to experience it for yourself, and you have to see where this goes. And not all of these Breaking Through Gravity episodes are going to be an hour and 15 minutes long, and I might even figure out a way to start to uh, take out little pieces of this and reintroduce it. But there is a lot of cheerleader bandwagon soapbox on these episodes, because I am seeking to use utilize inspirational language in order to fire you up to motivate yourself to move forward. When you first decide you're going to step into sobriety and recovery, you're going to have to deal with stigmatizing language patterns in your own head and externally. And I want you to realize that no matter what you think about yourself, no matter the limitations you want to place upon yourself, that I truly do believe there's somebody greater in you than you've ever even realized. Not because I've achieved it for myself and I'm still achieving it each and every day. No. No, because I have fallen on my face more times than once. Hell, at least two or three times today alone. But because I know that the human spirit, it's, it's this indomitable force that pushes, that pushes through even the most difficult circumstances. We are like little tiny drops of water on that stone. And if we can just get into a crack and freeze, we could split that whole damn rock. We could split our self away from who we think we've always been and we can become a new person. And as you're learning to become that new person, realize that sobriety is fragile. It is amazing. It is beautiful. And throwing rocks in your own glass house is ridiculous. Treat others with kindness because you know what it's like to not have been treated with kindness. And if you break a certain part of your house, you have the ability to put it back together because you're gathering resources. You're listening to my show. You're meeting with mentors or sponsors or coaches or therapists. You're, re- you're reading books and you're listening to other podcasts and you're watching YouTube videos. Like We have a wealth of knowledge at our fingertips. Let's stop acting like we don't know that this information's out there. And let's start treating others like we want to be treated. And it starts in your own mind first because that's the house you live in more than any other house on this planet is the one inside your own mind. Clean that up first and you'll be amazed how beautiful the outside world looks then. As always, my friends, inclusivity over exclusivity, the power of positive energy, release and flow. Every day is the best day of our lives when we wake up sober. Shout out to Sunshine and Robert. Glow on. See you next week.
拜拜。